And we are live. Welcome, folks, to episode 3475 of the Survival Podcast. It's a Thursday. Um, given I've done kind of a lot of, let's say, listener feedback and uh, current events issues recently, I thought I would take this Jack only Thursday and dig into a more homesteading permaculture topic and something that I think is universally beneficial to anybody that pays attention to it because as I say all the time, when I talk about modern survivalism, you know, food is actually way more important than guns. It's not that guns aren't important, but I've, uh, I've only been in a few altercations in my life. I was only ever shot at once in my life. And I, I, uh, (laughs) I didn't care for it, but I've had to eat every day and our ability to eat is directly linked to fertility. Even those of us who are far more carnivorous in our diet, even those of you, like I'm not full carnivore, I'm more of a ketovore. Um, But even those of you who are full on carnivore without fertility, your animals have nothing to eat. You have no animals to eat. This is, this is, this is key. And for health of human and animal kind, we also have to have nutrient density in the vegetable matter Uh, the plant matter that forms the base of everybody's food chain. So whether you're living highly on a omnivore's diet, you're living primarily on a plant-based diet, or you're living primarily on a meat-based diet, your food chain in the end starts out with plant material. But the plant's food chain, technically your food chain as well, goes way down into what's called soil food web. And there's a tremendous amount of interaction. There's a whole universe in a couple handfuls of active, live, stable soil. It's a universe onto itself. Just as much as you can hold in two hands, the volume of life in there, if you just talk about, you know, counting individual bodies of living things, bacteria, fungi, nematodes, etc., is, is like a world onto itself. And your backyard indeed is like a universe if it's living and thriving the way that it's supposed to. If we don't have that, then we have a weak link in our food supply system. And the reason this is an important topic is because of expense and because of availability and because of the environment. Now, because I don't partake in the global warming hysteria, And notice I have never once said humans have no effect on the climate on the planet. I've never said that. What I have said is this idea that CO2, the air we exhale, is going to cause us all to die if the Earth's temperature rises a degree. It's mass hysteria. It's nonsense. And it's nothing but using your fear against you. It doesn't mean I don't care about the environment. And there's an incredible environmental cost in the way that we continue to do business. There's an incredible financial cost. And then there's a long-term risk. So here's my four primary problems with this system of we just need NPK. We just throw the fertilizer on. And I've listened to farmers talk about this during some supply shortage stuff and things like that. And they'll say, well, if you want to know the formula, I'll tell you. You get X amount of acres. You put Y amount of of, of nitrogen, X amount of phosphorus, et cetera. And then you get this much corn per acre. And they think that way. Well, here's the problem. One The chemical fertilizers, because they end up with dead soil, are just the first step, the the, the key thing that leads to the whole biocides cocktail. So the farmer, though, I just need fertilizer or the stuff won't grow. Well, now you need an herbicide because you're over fertilizing and the weeds are going nuts. So you need an herbicide. Well, now you need a plant that can handle the herbicide. So now you need a GMO form of corn. So you can spray your herbicide on it and suppress the weeds while the corn grows. Of course, now you've wiped out all diversity in the soil food web in the field as well, above and below ground. So now you have pest problems. So now you need insecticides or you need plants that grow their own insecticides because they're GMO, right? And it just cascades and you end up spray, 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 apply, 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 apply. So what ends up happening then is the cost is driven up. And so just the cost of fertilizer itself is more than doubled in the last two years. So this has, and this shows that this complete abundance of all the components for base fertilizer is not 
as readily available as we think. And the processes that a lot of it that produce it are also really bad for the environment as well, right? So that's a problem. And then because we have dead soil, dead fields, no diversity, no soil food web, the amount of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and other amendments that farmers are forced to put on their soil exceeds the amount the plants actually need by a great deal because a lot of it's going to wash away. So I have to put enough on where it's not so much that it burns the roots of my plants, but when it washes away, because it will, that there's enough left for the plants to use. So all of this leads to giant dead zones in our ocean as all of this nutrient washes into uh, our, our, our rivers and streams and creeks that ends up eventually in our oceans. It ends up in denuded, eroded farmland, and it ends up in a continuous spiral upward of cost that's not just straight inflation. It's There's less of the material that we need. It's harder to get. It becomes more and more expensive. And right now, without the subsidies that farmers enjoy on key core crops like soy, like corn, like wheat, there's not a farm in the United States right now growing conventionally that would make a profit without the subsidies. Let me say that again. There's not one farm in the United States on any scale growing the big food crops conventionally that would make a profit if it was not for subsidy. Okay, you can see we have a problem. This is not sustainable. So if we're going to grow in our own backyards, if we're going to grow anything from a kitchen garden to a large family homestead garden, to a small market garden, to a small farm, to a small farmstead level, even up to like a multi-acre commercial you know, farm garden, we probably don't want to emulate that. And the temptation is there because it does work and it is easy. It does work and it is easy and it's kind of the fastest way to production. And it's why it's done so often and so frequently because if I throw 10, 10, 10 on the soil where I plant my peppers, they will grow and they will produce. But I will have to keep doing it over and over and over again, nonstop, forever, and the effect will wane over time. So my cost to do it will go up. The damage to my soil life will go up over time until it's denuded and dead. And my cost expectance will go up. And then this is now a financial burden on me. So if it wasn't a resource burden, if it wasn't an environmental problem, it's a continuous input that I have to pay for. So I don't want it for that reason alone. And it is one of the biggest input costs of any agricultural concern from the small garden to the large farm. Your, your, your big expenses today, it's really not labor anymore except for certain crops because everything's automated. It's fuel. So I'm talking farms now, not your backyard. It's fuel. It's, it's fertilizer and, and, and the various biocides, right? And it's seed. Those are your three big expenses. So one of your three key expenses can be cut to almost nothing, at least over time, if you use the approaches to building fertility that we're going to talk about today. Because I have to tell you, and Mike, I know who is a graduate of Elaine Ingham's course, would tell you flat out, it's more about the life and the soil than the total amount of NPK. We're going to talk about that today, too. Before we do, let's go ahead and remind you guys, if you like this show and you want to support us, uh, one of the ways you can do that is by doing business with our sponsors. And we're talking about fertility today, and I said food is more important than guns. It doesn't mean guns aren't important. And a gun without ammo, expensive club. That's all they are. You have to have ammo to be able to run that gun, to train with that gun, to put food on your table, to defend your family and your home. And so you want ammo. You want it fast. You want it at the best price. Go to BulkAmmo.com today. They've been a sponsor of this show for about nine years now. So it is definitely a place that you want to check out. Remember, gold and, uh, gold and silver may be precious metal, but the other precious metal, copper jacketed lead. Speaking of that, though, precious metal is a great way to help assure your wealth. While I talk about stacking Satoshis and Bitcoin all the time, I have never stopped being bullish on silver and gold as well. I just think they take a different place in your portfolio of wealth preservation. I recommend around 5% of your total net worth in silver and or gold. That's a fairly low amount. 
And I think it makes sense. It's generational wealth that can be handed down. No one even needs to know that it was handed down. It can be sold in small amounts with no real tax consequences. It's always there, and it has a history of thousands of years of being used as money. So why JM Bullion, though? Why not somebody else? JM Bullion has better pricing than Monex, Atmex, and Lear Capital. J.M. Bullion has a president named Michael who I can talk to directly if you ever have a problem, though I don't have to talk to him very often. Okay, J.M. Bullion will ship your order for free, and J.M. Bullion has sponsored the show that you listen to all the time for more than a decade. That's why you should deal with them. Oh, and if you're an MSB member, they give you a discount as well. That would be another good reason to do business with J.M. Bullion. I don't know why you would give your business to anybody else under those circumstances. So now let's get into this. Let's get into this uh, kind of digging into what we're really talking about here. I, I've said this already, but I'm going to say it again as we, we kick off the actual presentation. Fertility is as much or more in some ways about the life in soil than this, the raw amount of nutrient. So a lot of these commercial fertilizers they're soluble fertilizers, meaning as long as there's enough water present for them to start dissolving, the plants can use them without assistance from biology in the soil. And this, when it was discovered, was actually a revolutionary idea that you could, you could just you know, pour acid on these rocks or take this byproduct of, um, uh, of petroleum production. You could mix it together in certain ratios and give it to the plant and the plant would be able to use it. And I don't want to claim it doesn't work because that's asinine. And the green revolution coming from post-World War II to today and using these technologies are why we have been able to grow the population of the planet from about two and a half million in 1950 to just under uh, two and a half billion in 1950 to just under eight billion people today. Just it's like 7.7 .7 billion people today. And this has fed the world, but we're hitting that point of diminishing returns. And so there is, in, in just about any soil except the worst of the worst, there is nitrogen. There is potassium, right? Uh, there is phosphorus. It's there. What the plants need is a relationship with the soil biology in order to access it. So are most of your macronutrients, your manganese, your selenium, your zinc, your, your, your calcium, your magnesium, etc. This is all there. But the plants can't get it. It's not readily available unless there's a life web, unless there's something going on in the soil creating these exchanges. And what we really need to understand is that both sides need each other. You can have beautiful soil, lots of carbon in it, great tilth, right? But no plants. Cover it with a tarp. And we use this as a strategy sometimes to kill off certain plants and to build up fertility. But if you keep it that way long enough and there's not any plant interaction, most of the soil life will either die or go into some form of a stasis because the food web requires the interactions. So one of the ways that happens is that plant roots themselves do something called an exudation process. They produce an exudate, a little globule. And it's basically some carbohydrate, some protein, uh, mixed together, it's basically like a little cookie or a little cake. And a lot of the soil creatures eat that. It's how they form the symbiotic relationships with the plants. And if you take that away, sooner or later, the soil again becomes lifeless or very weak on life. So we have to have the two working together. And so it's important that we not let any piece of ground go fallow too long or be uncovered too long, especially. Both of those are bad. UV radiation eliminates and kills these critters stone cold, but just a few centimeters, a few millimeters really below the soil line, they're protected if they have the right cover anyway, and they need the plants to react. And even though everything I'm telling you today is true, and most soil has everything plants need in it, and plants can get it from this interactive process, if the soil's bad enough, you may need amendments early on to get stuff up and going to get that process. Like 
work with nature, but give nature something to work with. Or if there is a nutrient that is specifically lacking to a large degree, especially a micronutrient like it, like a zinc or an iron or a calcium or a magnesium or a selenium or something like that, that will need to be amended, especially for plants that have a high need of that. And that would mean that what I'm saying is if you test the soil for it, it's not there at all. That you'll probably have to amend, at least in the beginning. But it's okay. And then as we go forward, I want you to remember one of my earliest permaculture principles that I came up with. So I think every good permaculturist in time, we might look at David Holgram's 12 principles. We might look at there's like 80 Molisonian principles if you read through all the work and pick them out though they're not generally published as a list. But if you look at just about any permacultures, they've, they've over time developed their own principles. And the principles are really just new ways of stating the old so that you can be a good educator and giving people a way to think about things so that they can understand that principle and integrate it in their life. And so when I read Bill Mollison's lectures that are documented by a, a place called Barking Frogs Permaculture, it's a lecture series that he did in Florida in the 1980s. I never read this statement, but it's what I came away with. And that is that the forest floor is a lake. What I did is I was reading this and he talked about how much water was held in, you know, uh, a foot of top of good forest soil. And when I started thinking about it, if you folded the forest square area onto itself, a large forest of, let's say, 100,000 acres would be a lake several feet deep of 10,000 acres. And that's how much water was in the humus and the soil layer in that forest. And that, that forest really can only be healthy if that is the case. If there's enough carbon and other organic material there to hold that moisture in. And the reason you do a principle like this, you come up with a way of stating this, is so people can take it beyond what you're saying. So that really is a way of saying, of all the soil systems, the forest is mostly indicative of this concept of it, soil being a lake. But all the soil, if it's healthy, is a lake. There's a lot of water held in that soil, and that water is that soil's life. And so we can't let the soil go fully dry. We've got to have enough organic matter in the soil to hold on to the moisture. And if it does go dry, think of it just like you have a fish tank, a beautiful fish tank. And it's got microscopic organisms and pretty fish and plants and all kinds of stuff going on. It stuff you can see and stuff you need a microscope to see. If that tank goes dry, everything dies quickly. That's your soil. That's your soil. So we don't want things exposed. We don't want them dried out. We'll wipe out this life web we're trying to create. One more thing, because we're going to talk from this point forward, mostly about some amendment processes, some things we can grow that are fertility in of themselves, harvesting waste streams. But if you have broad acreage and you have livestock, rotational grazing done properly is the way, as in the Mandalorian, it is the way. I was talking about this with my grandson today. We were standing looking out our, the front picture window from my dining room, and you look at the grass right now, and it's gorgeous. It's so green that it almost doesn't look natural. That's how green it is right now. It is lush. It is insane. And it's been a good year rain-wise, finally. So all the neighbor's yards are green. They look nothing like ours. They look nothing. They're not as lush. They're not as, they're not as deep. They're not as green and they have nobody's mowed yet because it's really scrubby growth of grass. Even with the ducks constantly feeding on the grass, I'm probably going to have to go ahead and mow some. And that is all because of the animals distributing their deposits throughout the property in a free range and somewhat controlled model by moving their support systems is how we do things here. And when we moved in, I would say 50% of the property didn't even grow grass or weeds. It was dirt, exposed dirt. And it wasn't by like intent. It just wouldn't grow. And so if you want to rapidly evolve a property, livestock is the way on a broad scale. It really is. All right. So let's move it into growing our fertility. 
And there's two primary ways in my view to grow fertility. One is the use of cover crops. And this can put a lot of nitrogen in the soil through, for, through leguminous species, um, like Austrian winter pea. So a good winter crop would be Austrian winter pea. Uh, or cow pea is a spring summer crop. Is a, you may not actually be growing it for harvest, but you're growing it for the bulk organic matter and the nitrogen fixing of the roots. But remember what I said, that the forest floor and therefore your garden soil is a lake. And the lake needs all of the participants working together. And if it doesn't have that, it will not become the life evolving ecosystem that you want it to be. It just won't. It can't get there without your help. And it can't get there without the plant's help. So a lot of the other plants that we use as cover crops, they are as much to put the roots in the soil and get the biology going as they are anything else. And there are times with... Soil that's kind of new, you know, like I have some raised beds that I really haven't managed yet heavily and they need to kind of go into a level of management this year so they can become something valuable on our homestead. And what I'm going to grow in them this year, you wouldn't think of it as a cover crop. It is going to have multiple yields, but it really is doing the job of a cover crop and the crop is sorghum. And the reason I'm going to grow sorghum in it, it is that sorghum doesn't need a whole lot of fertility to do really well. It's incredibly drought tolerant. The, the grain yield off it is craved by my ducks. And as early as I'm planting it this year, once it grows up and seed heads with my long growing climate, I can actually cut it, use the biomass to amend the soil that grew it take the grain heads, dry them out and use them as feed. And it will literally coppice like a tree, grow back and produce at least one additional crop. I may get three this year. So you might think, well, Jack's doing that because he's getting feed for his ducks. That's a byproduct. I'm doing it because this is a plant with a massive root system that will be left in the soil over next winter as we transition that to uh, more intensive crops. So that's a cover crop that doesn't look like a cover crop. And this is the wisdom in not ever letting soil go fallow if it works with what you're doing this year. I didn't do that with my main gardens this year. I did put them to bed. I put tarps over them. But that's one winter season. That's fine. They'll, they'll do fantastic. We're starting to do our early spring planting right now. I just needed a break. But it would have been better if I had seeded it with winter pea and like fava bean and like a like a winter wheatgrass or kyasote or something like that. Right. That would have been a better choice. You want those roots. Another way to grow your fertility, though, is to grow plants that can directly be used for fertility. Probably the best one on the planet for this is a plant that we've discussed before. And I'll probably be doing a whole show on it very soon called the Zola. A Zola is a nitrogen-fixing aquatic fern. It floats on water and it produces its own nitrogen out of the air like a bean does in the soil. It does this incredibly well. It's incredibly effective at it. And that means that uh, with a little bit of nutrient help, whether it be from wildlife or whether it be from fish or whether it be from livestock waste, uh, you can grow it in just about any water. And I know I do a lot with backyard ponds and stuff like that. And you might be like, well, you know, Jack, he has all these ponds and stuff. You can grow this stuff in kiddie pools. You can dig, if you don't have ducks that are going to go in there and eat it all on, you can dig a trough that's six, eight inches deep, two foot wide, a hundred foot long, and throw a cheap tarp in it. And add some nutrient and throw some azola in it and grow it like crazy. The one thing you're going to need to do in a lot of climates, though, like mine, you either need to have a place where it gets sun in the, like you want, again, you're back to the same thing with the garden. Eastern sun, western shade. The hottest part of the day, it will not do well. And it will start to have problems and it will stop producing for you. Or you need to put like uh, a shade net over it. Uh, like a 40% shade cloth would be a good thing in my climate. Further north, it might be more like 20 but when it gets hot, it, it turns black and it dies. And so I have tanks that it grows in all season long, and I have tanks where it just gives up and quits at a certain point. But it is very high in nitrogen. You do not have to do 
anything to it to use it as a fertility boost. You can literally take it out of the water and put it at the base of your plants and it will help with fertility. It will dry up and it will get incorporated into the soil. The worms and other critters will come over and eat it, incorporate it into the soil. That's all you got to do. You can mulch with it continuously all year. You'll never use too much of it. It's also great livestock feed. I had the guy on that talked about using Azola in a greenhouse operation and pelletizing it and using it as an energy source. And I said, after I had that guy on, I think he's onto something, but I don't think this is quite the way. And the, the simple reason is Azola is way too valuable as animal feed and fertilizer to use it as feedstock for fuel, in my personal opinion. It, now, if you can grow enough of it, maybe that's not true anymore. But in my experience and in, with what I'm looking at, the fact that this stuff is instant fertility plus incredibly high protein feed for livestock I just think it has a higher use and then take that livestock waste and use that for, you know, more fertility and then grow your biomass and use your surplus biomass as fuel. That, that makes a lot more sense to me, but you know, if he can make that work, that's good for him too. But um, Azola and other aquatic plants are, are tremendous. Uh, Mitchell says comfrey with a question mark. Comfrey is a good plant to grow for some level of fertility it, it's not really a bunch of nitrogen it's more of a a mineral booster it is pretty good for that um, it's not as good as some things you can buy in like uh, kelp meal or liquid kelp that we'll talk about in a bit but it's good and it makes a good green manure tea um, it's referred to as a dynamic accumulator meaning those big long roots with their exudate process do really good at mining minerals and so when we put comfrey leaf back to the soil, we're providing minerals in a formless plant available. I think personally that's been a little bit over, overplayed by some. I think it does do that. I don't think it's as good at it as a lot of authors have made people believe that it is. But it's definitely a good one to grow too. It's also a good one to grow just for life in general. Um, it's a good medicinal for your own use. It's good for livestock. You can overfeed comfrey to animals like pigs. If you feed pigs a diet of 70% comfrey, you will kill them. You'll kill them. But no pig is going to eat 70% of their diet in comfrey if they are free ranging where there's comfrey. It's not going to happen. You'd have to confine them to do And that's what they did. That's how they determined that threshold. Um, but I, I use comfrey everywhere. And I recommend you do too. Uh, let's talk about some composting methods and with a little bit of com commentary on each. I'm not going to really tell you like specifically how to do all these, or this would become a very long podcast. More what I want to do is make you aware of what's available to you as far as dealing with waste streams and composting, what the pluses and minuses are. I don't believe that there is a perfect composting method. I don't think that exists. Everything you do with compost has trade-offs to where there's another way you could do it and certain things would be better and maybe certain things not as optimal. Sometimes it's just about labor. And if you don't have time to put the labor in, then it doesn't matter that it might produce a great, great product. So the most common way that people make compost in large amounts anyway is, uh, is like large pile frequent turning compost. And as I go on with this, just remember, like I said, none of these are perfect, but perfect is the enemy of the done, right? We had a guest say that recently. I really like that. You know, perfect is the enemy of the done. And so you can sit around looking for perfection while I eat if you want to. So the large pile and frequent turning, Jeff Lawton's made this pretty famous. You can get really good finished compost 18 to 21 days with it. And you're turning like first time, like 48 hours and then like every third day. It's a lot of turning. And it's a lot of work and I don't like it and I'm probably never going to do it again. So you might think that I'd say you shouldn't either. Now, if you like it, you don't mind. You have the time. You have a teenager who's been, you know, a pain in the ass recently and you need work for him to do. You have the massive amount of quantities that you could be making this cubic yard or more of a pile at a time over and over throughout the year. You need the production to be quick enough to get the compost into a usable uh, status. Like there's a lot of reasons to do it. The speed 
And if you do it right, it makes very good compost. Very good compost. It tends to be more bacterial dominant than some of the other methods that I'm going to give you that tend to move more fungus activity into your compost. Here's the thing about composting. Whether you do it right or wrong, getting bacterial activity is going to happen. Getting fungal activity generally takes more work and more strategic thinking to get a higher fungal compost. And what people will often refer to that is a fungal dominant pot, uh, uh, compost. I've seen compost with a lot of fungal activity in them. I've never actually seen one that you would really call fungal dominant. In other words, of the of bacteria and fungi in the compost, 51% or more of the total volume is fungi. I've not seen that. Maybe it's happened. I don't think it's likely to happen, especially if you're counting individual life forms. We're going to tend toward the bacterial. Um, let's just, and that's not bad. It just is. And I personally think we have more longevity and quality of a compost if it has a significant amount of beneficial fungi in it. And I think that you'll find that you get less of that with a large pile, frequent turn, really hot compost than if you do things a little bit differently. And one of the reasons is less the heat, but the turning itself. So fungi likes to form strands, right? We call them mycorrhizal strands. And every time you turn, you're shattering any of the inroads the fungi have made. So the less we turn, the more the fungi is undisturbed and the more it can grow, expand, and, and reproduce itself. So that's one of the reasons I think the other thing with the turning method is, and I don't want to get deep into exactly what to do and when, but when we, when you turn this compost, it's really important that you're using a, a, a compost thermometer and you're not letting it get too hot or too cold before the process is done to get things done right with Compost that gets too hot. I don't remember exactly what the um, bacteria is called now. It's like right on the tip of my brain and I can't pull it out. But there's a particular bacterium that will form in really hot compost. We get up over 160 degrees. You'll look at this compost sometimes. This is very common in commercial compost. And people say, oh, it's, it's persistent herbicides. A lot more often it's this bacterium. And you'll look at this compost and it has white strings in it. You'll think, oh, that's fungal hyphae, right? That's good. The fungus is going, but it's not a fungus. It looks like a fungus. And what you'll find when you know this is your issue, uh, your tomatoes grow like total garbage. A lot of your beans really look unhappy. But if you plant something like uh, broccoli or cauliflower, Right. Or your, your mustards, you know, and things like that, things that come out of the whole cabbage world. That's it. Acetobacteria. Yeah, that's it. If you if you have a compost that's gone that direction, it will eventually correct. But in your first season or two, it's going to want to grow things, certain things really well and certain things really crappy. And a lot of people are going to look at that and they're going to say that it's, you know, it's the Paul Wheaton thing. It has persistent herbicides. It may be probably not. By the way, if you have persistent herbicides that get into a garden, you don't have to strip it down, bring in dump trucks, take it all away. All you got to do is make really good, high-quality compost tea and give it a few applications of that, and it'll lock that shit up and make it inert. Uh, if you check out Billy Bond's channel, he actually had an area where they got some herbicide in, and that's exactly what they did, and it worked out really well for them. And they're pretty sure it wasn't what I just said. It was an herbicide problem. Uh, but th that's... That's the issue is, is it's a lot of labor and you got to get it right. And there's nothing wrong with it, except I honestly don't have time to constantly be turning compost and I don't want to. So I've looked for other methods um, and I'm kind of lumping Johnson Sioux and other no turn methods together here. I think most of the no turn methods are some version thereof of what Johnson Sioux is doing or Johnson Sioux is some version of theirs. So Johnson Sioux is generally done in a cylindrical pattern. It's generally a very woody dominant uh, compost method. So using a lot of wood chips, that pushes you 
toward the fungal, though I do it with uh, with coop bedding, and my coop bedding is all straw, and and some wood chips mixed in, and it works fine for that. And what's done with Johnson Sioux is your nitrogen, your carbons are combined. It's made really wet. And when I say really wet, I mean people that do the 18-day method would say that's too wet. But it's not for the way that it's done. And it's piled up. And since it's going to use a light carbon like a wood chip or like a straw, it is going to be able to breathe because of the way it's designed. And the Johnson Sue method, they put down a pallet on the bottom and stack the compost material on the top so there's airflow from underneath. They put four to five pipes down through the compost and those pipes are left until the compost pile kind of sets up and then they can be pulled off, pulled out and you'll have holes going down into your compost that will stay like that because you're not going to turn it long term while the compost breaks down. And you never turn it. And what you do, you put a compost thermometer in and you'll see it'll get right up near 160, but I've never had one go over ever. And it'll very slowly start to come back down. And when it gets down into the range of like 90 degrees Fahrenheit or lower, that high active point is done, right? Then what they do with Johnson Sioux is they add worms. In addition to this, they put a drip line on top and it goes off for a certain like a minute every day and it stays damp. It never dries out. Um, I just wet mine down with the garden hose. And what I actually figured out is if you take a piece of four inch thin wall pipe and you make that your set like drain pipe, like French drain pipe, you make it your center pipe. And I use three inches around it. The little cheap plastic green sprinklers, they sell for you know, eight bucks a piece or less Walmart, Home Depot, Lowe's, those little things, they fit directly on a four inch pipe. They barely fit like a, like a ring on a ring finger and it holds them steady. And you just set that there and you set a timer and you turn it to 30, you know, one minute. And, and, and then you've automated that and you keep it moist. This works really good. And it's made the best compost that I've ever seen. The, the, the compost that it makes is, and people get weird when I say this or when they see Johnson Sue's, which is even more clay-like than mine. It's clay-like when it's really wet. And I mean really wet. And what I mean by that isn't that it is clay. Don't misunderstand me. I mean that you can form it into a ball and it'll hold like clay. If you drop it from not too high, it'll stick together. But if you push on it or drop it from a high, it'll crack and break apart and crumble. And if you apply it or tea made from it to soils that are soils that as they dry out, they become almost like concrete. Um, well, they stop doing that even when they dry out. They get much easier to work to crumble to keep to maintain tilth in. Johnson Sue says you can use one ton of their compost to the acre. That is so little. Uh, you can't even like say that's two millimeters of cover. Like you wouldn't see it to spread it out, but that's how powerful it is because it's all about the life, the fungi, et cetera. And the compost tea from it's pretty incredible too. I make smaller batches. They're about one cubic yard each. I get three of them a year out of my coop. Uh, by bringing out the coop waste, and I just put them in goat fencing that's four foot tall, uh, four pipes around and one in the center. Those that came to the workshop, we didn't do the one in the center. We should have. I had to get down in there and dig a hole and force that four-inch pipe in for that uh, sprinkler to work, but it, it works really, really good. That's how I'm going to do them from now on. Four three-inch and one four-inch. And again, you can pull those pipes out and use them for the next one. But I would also say that any compost pile that you you pile it up and you leave it alone okay falls into this general macro category no turn and you're going to have a mixture of aerobic and anaerobic breakdown in this and people say well the anaerobes are bad and elaine ingham will lose her mind of over any anaerobes or whatever everything cycles in time and so if you're not looking to use this compost, you're going to make it today and use it in 30 days. I don't think it's that important, but it brings me to my next method. And 
I think this is where I'm going to start going with my method. So Johnson to use, so uses a passive means by which to allow airflow through. And I skipped it entirely. I do not have a pallet at the bottom of mine. I just threw them on the ground. They're fine. I started thinking about taking some four inch pipes, put them on a chop saw and cut a bunch of lines in them. And maybe just do at the bottom of the pile, uh, you know, like a four way. So that there's that center pipe goes down and there's four of those pipes come in to let more air in from the sides or something. I don't think it's necessary either. Um, but what forced air is, is people use a variety of things. They use blowers like, oh, the ones that, that inflate a bouncy house. There's other blowers that are a little bit smaller. Some people use air compressors. But one way or another, you have a timer and you build some sort of a manifold, some sort of pipes with holes in them or something like that. At the bottom of your pile, what would work really good, by the way, would just be on like on my size would just be a piece of the flexible black four inch uh, drain, like French drain stuff with the slots already cut in it. Just make a loop of that and push your air into it. And it's going to move up through the pile that way. And I've seen people do it where it goes off for 15 minutes twice a day. I've seen people that do it for it goes off five minutes every hour. I've seen a bunch of different ways people do it. But all it is, is it's providing the oxygen, increasing the aerobic activity and minimizing the aerobic activity, right? Or the, the anaerobic activity. So aerobic means with oxygen, anaerobic without oxygen. And the anaerobes tend to be the soil organisms that we're not really looking for. And the aerobic uh, ones are the ones we are. If you think about a plant, where does it want to grow? Does it want to grow in anaerobic conditions or aerobic conditions? Does it want highly compacted soil or soil that can breathe? Yeah, pretty simple, pretty simple. Um, so the forced air and zero turn methods. I would also add black soldier fly composting if you have a waste stream that's right for them. I've never done black soldier fly. I've been very impressed with two things. The response to compost that comes from black, the black soldier fly leftovers <laughs> I've seen incredibly good results on plants with that. And compost tea made from black soldier fly uh, residue is unfreaking believable the difference in a plant when it's hit with it. And it has me thinking that one of the real strategies going forward, though I just don't have the waste stream to feed black soldier flies really, is compost tea made from black soldier fly compost inoculating biochar and then add it into the rest of these processes. Uh, I think that might turn into something pretty incredible. And I think it's partly that black soldier fly um, by the very way that they act and the way that they move and the fact that they're constantly eating, you're never going to get anaerobic conditions because they're always moving. And if you look, it's crazy. I mean, you throw an apple in and they, they'll just devour it. Uh, I think if you laid down in there, they'd eat you. I really do. And, and they're incredibly fast. And then you have a byproduct of feed in the larva, and then you still have the compost. So I think that's a great method. Somebody here mentioned mushroom. Not on my list because I don't have any experience with it. Uh, I'm not good at growing mushrooms. I think my climate sucks for it. But if you can grow mushrooms, mushroom compost is fantastic. If you have a mushroom-growing friend, that's a great source of compost. It can also be like – how great is it to take mushroom compost and incorporate it into whatever compost you're doing as a fungal inoculum would be one of my points there. Uh, last, though, is vermicomposting. And uh, again, I'm going to mention that I found this new worm farm, the Urban, Urban Worm Bag Farm. Uh, I have a link in the show notes for it today. I think this might be one of the best ways to do vermicomposting there is because the whole bag can breathe and because it's suspended, less subject to invasion by ants and things like that. I do want to talk about, well, had I not found this, if you have an ant problem, you just can't swallow 130 bucks for this thing. Uh, I understand. And I'm going to tell you what I was about to do. I was about to build uh, worm composting built on a system of five gallon buckets or something similar. Something can lock close. I was even thinking, I can't remember what they're, gamma lids, I think they're called, for the five-gallon buckets where they screw on and off so that you don't have to pry them open uh, using those. And then either drilling a ton of air holes in that bucket using something like a 16-inch drill bit, which makes a hole too small for a, an adult fire ant to get in, or cutting out panels 
and then using adhesive or maybe even like a combination of adhesive and rivets or screws with some stripping and putting some very fine hardware cloth to allow breathability. So if you're having an ant problem like I did and you don't want to buy a system like this one, uh, I think that would be one way to circumvent that problem. It's just a suggestion. And there's other ways to do this. If vermicomposting doesn't require you know, something expensive like this, you know, specific farm or other ones that are out there. People do it all the time. I've seen it done with, you know, Rubbermaid totes. I've seen it done with buckets. I've seen people actually just build them out of like boxes and maybe some form of a liner or what have you. I've, I know one guy, his, I had him on the show, the guy that I had on about bees, he's got freaking good Lord. It's like dozens of huge worm farms. And he, so he's, Producing enough fertility with worms, that's another product for sale from him. So there's from small scale to large scale, there's a lot of ways to do it. I wanted to tell you, though, now that I'm doing it, some of the things that I've switched on to really quick about things that you can give the worms that I think most people don't think about. I don't produce that much of a kitchen waste stream other than eggshells and coffee grinds. So there is some salad greens and stuff, especially as we get into where we're eating stuff out of the garden. But we are so carnivorous, I don't have a ton of stuff for them. But what I realized is, well, I have an unlimited food supply, which is straw out of my out of my duck coop that's been defecated on. They can they'll eat that like crazy. And then in my big compost piles, I put a big cap of wood chips on mine instead of tarping the top. Right. So I, I do my straw mixture down below and I cap with about three or four inches of just plain old wood chips. And that keeps everything below them very moist. Well, I can pull those wood chips back long before that compost is done, but it's not hot anymore. I can stick my hand down in there, grab a big clump of that and bring it to them. So those are two sources. But the, the source that I was like, wow, how does why doesn't everybody do this? Because it's otherwise a waste product. And what I've always done with it up till now is dump it into my secondary compost material bin. Because when I'm making those big composters I'm talking about, I have this pit that the ducks eat, ducks eat all their scraps, all their water plants, everything goes in there all year. And it ends up full, fairly deep. And each layer that we bring out from the coop, then we take a couple shovelfuls of that and we sprinkle it as an inoculum. So we're kind of turbocharging it there. So I've always just dumped the dust left in my duck feeders when they've eaten it down to nothing and they have that dust and the little fines they won't eat into that pit. You know what I do with it now? Feed it to my worms. It's perfect worm food. It's high protein, high nutrient, and it's dust. It's made for worms. If you bought worm food, it would probably be that. Plus, since I'm doing biochar now, I put a cup of biochar in their feed and mix it up every day. So my dust is black. Because my dust is the little tiny finds of biochar that didn't get eaten that mix. So now I'm feeding them biochar dust and finds from the poultry feed plus the, the other waste streams. And I just thought it was a good thing to point out to you guys. It might be like the reason I don't have a worm farm is I don't have enough material to feed the worms. There's always material to feed worms. There's always material to feed worms. Um, another thing that I thought of. Well, no, hold on. Um on the vermicompost, one of the things that is really interesting about vermicompost is it's not high in NPK. It's generally like a 111 or a 212 or something like that. It's going to vary depending on what worms, what you're feeding them, how quickly it's made, what have you. But it's biology. And I think that even if you have another composting method, you should be vermicomposting as well. And if nothing else, you know, then you're adding a half a handful every time you do a plant. Or if you make a furrow and you're going to plant it with beans, so you're just going to direct seed, so you're not placing a plant, that, you know, put put a, you know, a few centimeters in the furrow of your vermicompost, plant your beans and throw over and constantly be adding that life to your soil. You also realize when you start doing vermicomposting that there is a lot of fungal activity. And you'll see fungal hyphae. And I've even seen people that show, you know, mushrooms, literal little bitty mushrooms growing in their worm bins. I would also say about your worm bins, people get freaked out if there's like a gnats get in there. As long as your worms are happy 
anything that's in their breaking down material is in their breaking down material. I, um, having done a lot with terrariums and stuff in my life, uh, when you build terrariums and you add life to them, one of the, the little critters you add is a little critter called a springtail. And I think springtails go in, uh, you can look up what they are. They go in worm farms as much as worms do. They are a fantastic uh, thing for breaking stuff down. And because I usually take some leaf litter and stuff like that too into my worm farms, I usually end up with pill bugs in there. They're, they're welcome there too. The pill bug eats a thing. It takes a poop. Worm eats the pill bugs poop. Go nuts, go crazy. You know, if anything gets over to be a problem, overpopulation or whatever, maybe you have to deal with it. But I just don't sweat it. The only reason I even care that ants go in there is because the ants are like, hey, it's dark, it's cool, it's moist. I think we should live here. And then they're like, oh, look at all this protein. And they don't just colonize it and bite you when you try to do it. They literally kill all the worms. That's that's why I have an ant problem. It's not that the ants themselves, if they just, if, if all they did was come there, take some food and leave, I, I wouldn't have that big of a problem with them. But that's not how fire ants work. Uh, apparently, I've talked to a lot of people in other climates that don't really have a fire ant problem, and they will have ants show up in worm farms that don't really cause a problem. All I could say is if you've ever dealt with fire ants, you'll grow comfrey. Because if you get tore up on your hands with, with fire ants, the first thing you want to do is grab a big comfrey leaf, macerate your hand, and just rub comfrey juice all over it. And if you do that, you will never get the really bad breakout or anything like that from the ants. And if you don't do it fast, and I mean within five minutes of being bit, bit, it'll help, but it won't prevent those really nasty kind of breakout that you get from them. All right, moving on. Sources of waste. You know, where do we get the material to compost? One, and this is a big one for people with livestock, is bedding. Coop bedding, barn bedding, caged animal bedding, et cetera. Uh, it's a fantastic source. And the beauty of that is we're usually using a carbon like wood chips or straw in our base. And then the animals are pooping there. And when there gets to be too much poop, we either clean it out or we add more carbon. And we keep doing that in a deep litter system, which is what I do with my ducks and chickens. As soon as I walk in there and go, that's eh, a bit of an ammonia smell, I put down another layer of carbon. Since I've started making biochar, I'm putting down a five-gallon bucket of crushed biochar and then a straw bale or a couple loads of wood chips for my wood chip uh, that are out in the field to create that mix. So the beauty of this is when we're ready to compost that, I have never you know, added nitrogen to that carbon source other than I had it and I needed to get rid of it. So I've never thought I need to go out and get more nitrogen. Now, I have given it a kickstart. Like, sometimes we'll get a really nice patch of clover right about the time we're making compost. And I will, because that's high nitrogen, I will totally run the tractor by there, do a couple, like, keep pushing the, the, the windrow the same way, and then rake it up and put a few big handfuls of that in there. But you don't need it. The, the waste from the urine and the poop that's already bound up with that carbon all you do is add water and everything takes off. And so it's a great source. And if you know what you're feeding your animals, you know it's in your compost, right? And if you're keeping animals, generally you have to do it anyway. And I also wanted to point out things like caged animals. If you keep quail and you let them poop through into something that catches it, you know that quail seem to be the only animal I can think of. That you feed them a pound of feed and they give you two pounds of excrement. I don't know where the hell it comes. The amount those little guys poop makes a chicken look like it's lazy. So that would be a thing. But, you know, if you have rabbits, you have rabbit pellets plus the bedding that those pellets end up in. And rabbit, rabbit pellets, guys, that's just fertilizer. You can compost it. You can feed it to worms. You can do a lot of other things with it that are great. But you can take rabbit pellets and put it right in your garden. And it is what's called a cool manure. It means it can start feeding your soil right from the get out. I know people that keep rabbits for meat and they said, if I stopped eating rabbits, I would still keep one or two for the waste stream alone. But what, when I was thinking about that, it made me think of a possible waste stream that you might be able to tie into, feed your worms, especially a big worm operation, a just straight compost, feed your black soldier flies, right? 
that I, I never thought of before, and you might not have to do hardly any work. What you might need is a couple sealable barrels and a talk to someone that owns a local pet store. Now, I'm pretty sure if you talk to somebody that own, that works at PetSmart or Petco or any big national brand, they're going to tell you to go pound sand. But, but I bet you if you talk to Jimbo Jobs, Jimbo, Jimbo, Jimbo Bob's, you know, local pet store, or um, what I'm thinking for me is I buy a lot of stuff from a place locally called Russell Feeds. They have a pet section. They have, you know, guinea pigs and rats and mice and reptiles. And they feed a lot of, they, they supply a lot of feeder mice to people to keep reptiles. They have birds like parrots and parakeets and lovebirds and stuff. And all of these animals have, you know, usually it's aspen shavings that are put down in their cages. And somebody who probably makes maybe twice minimum wage has to clean all that crap out every week. And I'm going to bet they throw it away. I'm going to bet that it's just not worth it to them to do anything else with it but throw it away. But if you were to get like a 30-gallon syllable barrel or two so that you could swap them out and say, all you got to do is throw it in here and put the lid on it because it's dry. It's not going to really stink that bad, especially if it's covered, right? It's not going to really start to break down until it gets wet. And, you know, every week, every other week, when you call me, I will bring you an empty barrel and take away the full barrel. You may be able to get an almost unlimited supply of poopy carbon for free, and somebody does most of the work for you. And all you'd have to do is bring it home and dump it into whatever system you're going to use. So that was a thought that I had this morning when I was putting this list together. Um, another one is, you know, obviously kitchen scraps. And kitchen scraps to me are best fed to some livestock that will eat it. And then they kind of process what they don't like by pounding it, scratching it, you know, stomping it in or worms. The problem with kitchen scraps and composting, you know, even if you're doing one of the non-turn compost, it's like you, 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 you got a box of cake mix and it said add this much milk, this much egg, this much oil and this much water, stir it up and put it in the oven at 350 degrees for 30 minutes. And you thought, I know what I'll do. I'll break it up into 30 parts, and I'll make 30 little containers, and I'll put it, the first little bit in the middle of the pan and stick it in the oven, and I'll wait one minute, and I'll open the oven and dump the next part in and close the oven and wait to three minutes and dump the third part. And I'll do that all the way up to 30 minutes and wait one more minute, and I'll have a cake. Your cake's going to come out like crap, right? Because you're constantly restarting a process. So small amounts at regular intervals really screams worm farm or feed animals. And here's your other option. I don't have animals. I don't want a worm farm. I have kitchen waste on a daily basis. Heavily mulch your garden. Every day or every other day or twice a week. Take your, your bucket of kitchen waste out to your garden, pull back mulch, throw it on the soil, cover it with mulch. You put a banana peel down there, you cover it with mulch, come back two days later, can't find a banana peel, it's gone. Worms, soil critters, etc. will eat it. And it's kind of a compost in place. And if you do this with mulch on top of it, a lot of the parts of it that would normally off-gas end up in the soil instead of off-gassing. So that's another option you have if you don't have that. Um, pruning from weeds, seeds, any greens work really well. Be careful with weeds or grasses that can pass seed through the compost. Now you're adding compost to your garden and you're adding weed seeds or grass seeds. If you do your hot method, generally you don't have a problem. What I try to do is if I'm dealing with weeds, I'm cutting back stuff, whatever. If it doesn't have any seed produced yet, I'll throw that into the compost. If it started producing seed, I let it go to the ground. If it's in the garden, I let it go to the ground outside of the garden, or I'll throw it where the ducks are going to go through and eat it, and they'll do a pretty good job between the ducks and chickens of cleaning out the seed. That would be an, another way to deal with that. Then you've got your browns. So those are your greens that are naturally produced on your property. Your browns are going to be like your wood chips. Uh, straw, 
fallen leaves that are brown leaves, it's dried out leaves, etc. You've also got grass clippings and stuff like that that you can use. So uh, as your greens and what you always want to make sure is you have a good ratio between your greens and your browns. And I don't think the whole, like specifically it's got to be this exact ratio. I think you need more carbon than you need nitrogen. You know, if it's, if it's two thirds to one third, that's probably a bit heavy still on the nitrogen, but it's still going to work. But if you know, if it's like a, like a five to one ratio by I, and honestly, when I'm doing the majority of my composting, it's coming out of my coop. I don't know what the ratio is, and nobody does. Don't tell me you know what the you know exactly how many ounces of poop ducks and chickens do every night when they're sleeping in their coop. I don't think we need to get that precise. We're not baking bread here. We're making soil. And I guess you can, and maybe there's an advantage to it for some. I, I, I'm not going to sweat it. And my results, I think, speak for themselves. Somebody here asked about humanure, uh, Serrano. God bless you if you want to do it. And I understand why people do it. And I understand why people don't. It is a great way to close the waste stream loop. I'm not big on pushing it on people because since I don't do a thing, I don't mouth off to other people that they should do the thing. I don't think that's very genuine, right? You all should human. Do you do a check? No, no. I think that we need to get better at developing systems that people will be comfortable using for human waste streams. So I didn't even have humanure on my list. I did plan on mentioning it anyway, even if nobody had brought it up here. It's definitely something to look at. I definitely feel it's something that adding biochar to will help it actually not stink. Okay. The human waste stream that we should get comfortable with using for fertility, though, is urine. It's a lot easier. It's a lot less nasty, right? I mean, let's just take it to the most basic thing that we do as parents, right? Changing diapers. Do you want, if, if your spouse says it's your turn to change a diaper, do you want code yellow or code brown? Yeah, it's a real easy choice, right? Code yellow is way better than code brown when you're changing diapers, right? So, Urine's pretty easy to capture. There's a lot of ways to do it. I've seen people, they simply make an area, a little privacy integrated around it. They have straw available. You pee in a spot, you add some straw. When you've peed enough there, you add some more straw. And the straw binds with the urine and you end up with a great high nitrogen compostable. It, it, it will in time compost itself if you keep doing that. Because you're adding a, a moisture at the same time, right? So I've seen it done that way. Biochar is probably the number one way to harvest that waste stream now that I understand biochar. If you inoculate biochar with human urine, you're going to end up with a fertilizer that the NPK number on it's going to be somewhere around 1511 to 1522, where the most commonly ended up being about 1522. It's a very high nitrogen waste stream. I want to, without kind of making anybody feel bad if you don't want to do it. Understand what you throw away every time you take a leak and go down the toilet. You, as a human, on average, will produce enough urine that if you were to capture it and use it for fertility, you could grow over 300 square feet annually of plant bed area of high feeding plants so when you're looking at things like beans and stuff they don't give a shit about nitrogen they'll make all they need for themselves as long as they have good soil biology but when you're looking at some of the plants that we like to grow as humans like corn like tomatoes like peppers like squashes things that are heavy feeders that grow large amount of mass they need lots of nitrogen and i'm talking 300 square feet of that let's put that in perspective a four by eight bed is like the standard backyard gardener, permaculturist, prepper, homesteader garden bed. Probably because dimensional, you know, material comes in eight foot. You cut it in half, you get four foot. Four foot you can reach from both sides, so why not? So a four by eight bed is a pretty nice bed. 32 square foot. Let's round it down to 30 square foot. 300 square foot is 10 of those. 
your pea produces enough nitrogen. If there's none available, no nitrogen in the soil, and you're growing high nitrogen feeding plants to provide all the nitrogen fertility with some of the uh, potassium and phosphorus for 10 four by eight beds and down the drain, down the drain, down the drain. Okay. Unless you, like I'm on a septic, our stuff leaches throughout here. It actually improves the pasture where the leach field is. Most of you, it's going to a sewage treatment plant and it's adding to an environmental catastrophe, which is our current way we handle wastewater. And then you're going to go out and buy. Uh, Green Country said it's about a 50 pound bag of 10, 10, 10. So it's a fit. You're throwing away a 50 pound bag of fertilizer for every human that lives in your home every year if you don't capture that waste stream. Right. And somebody's saying, how precise do you need to be? Not very. You don't need to be very precise. What I have decided the best way to do this is, though, is to pee in a bucket of biochar. Well, actually, a bucket with some biochar in it. And if it starts to get too wet, add more biochar. You could do a mixture of fine sawdust chips or, or um, wood chips and biochar about 50-50. Right? That actually might be even a better way to go. And if it starts to get nasty at all, you just add more. And when it gets full, set it aside and let it dry out. And you'll end up with about a 15 2 2 there's a lot of ways to do it. Some people, they pee in a bottle. They put the bottle on the shelf. They let it sit for uh, six months. The acidity comes up a little bit, so it's less acidic. But if we're using biochar, then pulling it more toward neutral is a good thing with an acid anyway. Um, I think there's a lot of different ways to do it. But I think that throwing this waste stream away is incredibly wasteful. And Mr. Bearded Homesteader said, so is it a good idea to pee into a compost pile, sort of. But again, what are we doing? We're restarting, we're adding nitrogen and human waste to a compost pile that's already active, right? So it is better to pee on a waste stream that will eventually become a compost pile, in my opinion. If you've just made your compost pile and it's not heated up yet, I think it's a great way to go and Urine is a great compost activator. So if you do get yourself some jugs, and you might want to label them don't drink or sniff, right? Um, and you do store urine up, when you go to make a big compost pile, dumping a gallon of urine about the center of it is probably a great way to go. It's probably a great way to go. But biochar to me is the, the biggest thing. And again, I want you to think about that again. Three hundred square feet if you're just a married couple 600 square feet and if you are a couple even with a fairly large homestead maybe you're doing a main crop like a zone three grain or a corn or something and, and it would be more than that. i don't see a couple needing more than 600 square feet of garden space even if you're using half of it to grow fertility for the other half uh, i can't remember uh the guy that wrote the book on doing that, right? You actually are growing more fertility than you're growing food. Even if you're doing that, I don't see the need for more than 600 square feet for two people. That would be 20 garden beds. That's more than I want to do, just to be blunt. That's a, that's a hell of a resource that people who claim to be preppers trying to be build sustainable life throw away, and it's not the nasty experience that it, that, that it can be in dealing with solid waste. It's not that big of a deal. Um, you know, I, I think that we have gotten so disconnected with reality. And I think maybe men have less of a problem with this because we have a certain plumbing feature women don't, in spite of the fact that there's people that can't understand that anymore. So most men at some point in their lives have gone behind a tree and peed on the ground. So if you can pee on the ground, you can pee in a bucket. It's just not that big of a deal. So it's something that I, I just encourage you to look into. I don't want to soapbox it. Um, keys to growing soil life long term. I want to hit that a bit too. So remember the way I teach soil fertility is in three words. And, and these three words will never steer you wrong if you do it. And it's build hold increase 
and all three are necessary. When you first start working with soil, wherever you are, unless, unless somebody somewhere did it for you before you got it, that was under a good management practice, wherever you grow will probably not be highly fertile when you start. You're going to have to do something to build initial fertility. That may include organic fertilizer, like all these amendments are not necessarily bad. We're about to talk about them. But you need to build up to a level where the, it will be productive. But then, right, hold is everything. There's a certain amount of fertility the plant will use. But nature is a looped system. And if we're not removing the plant completely at the end of its growth cycle, we're leaving roots in, we're returning biomasses or composting and bringing it back, then our, our net out is not bad from the growing process itself, but erosion or forms of nutrient that are short-term, like your fertilizers, they're not long-term. Life is long-term. So what we do add, we want to hold, which means we want good practices. We want no soil erosion. We want that soil you know, well cared for so that we can hold on to it. And then we want to every year through some means continue to increase fertility. We can do that by more carbon in the soil. We can do that by further amendments. We can do that with more compost. We can do that just with good growing practices. Once we get to a certain point, we have we don't have to add much anymore. We end up adding compost because we need some place to put it. After we made it, because we had to deal with the waste stream, so we might as well put it in the garden. That's where we end up with if we do this right long term. But build, hold, increase. And don't forget, the soil is a lake. And we need to treat it like a lake to keep it alive. Um, compost teas. One of the biggest bangs for the buck. You can take, you know, a wheelbarrow full of compost and spread it out four or five beds and it'll help. But you can take a half a gallon of compost Put it in a paint strainer bag, stick it in a bucket, take a fish aquarium pump, throw two, four air stones in the water, bubble it for 48 hours, and that half gallon will bring as much life to those four beds as that wheelbarrow of direct compost application. Because we're going to magnify the amount of soil organisms because we're going to grow them in that compost tea. What we have to know about that, though, is the compost tea will also be more effective if we've effectively begun to build up the habitat for that soil biology. So the soil, like if you take shitty soil and you keep applying compost tea, it will eventually become great soil. But if you take slightly improved soil, you've built some tilth into it. You've built some structure into it. You've given it some life. You've started to grow some things and you compost tea that, your results will come much faster because you're seeding life into a life-favoring environment instead of saying, okay, guys, I know 99% of you ain't going to make it, but the survivors of the Mayflower will become the primary descendants of Americans. Kind of that is what you're doing there. You're going to have a lot of people die off in a plague. You're going to have a lot of them. And, and remember, these are short-lived critters anyway, but there still is. Do they thrive enough to to begin the reproduction process and the colonization process. So the further along you get to soil, as we use this compost tea, the better. High fungal compost. High fungal compost. So one of the reasons that I went to capping my compost piles with wood chips is, one, it's just easier than trying to make square weed block fit it around a round hole and stay put. Just kind of a pain in the ass. But two is... I dig into my wood pile when I do this. I don't take the stuff from the surface. I put that into buckets and put it in my next run for biochar because it's dried out. Okay. I look for where it's starting to break down and I, I'll, I'll dig into it and I'll smell it and I'll find a pocket that really smells mushroomy. That's what I make that big layer on top with. That fungal activity is going to go down into that compost and colonize it. So I want as much fungal activity as I can get in my compost because the fungal activity in the soil is far more of a long-term thing 
than is the bacterial activity. The other thing is there are fungal hyphae. We've actually got microscopic images. I'm sure Mike's seen them in his course that he did with Elaine, where you'll see something like a fungal hyphae basically encircle and digest a, a, a problematic nematode. So we have beneficial nematodes and we have bad nematodes, right? And they'll literally kill and eat. The fungi will eat a living nematode. So we want to, and the fungi will actually form relationships with the roots and the hyphae will actually extend the root system. So we really want to go toward the fungal, more fungally prominent. I don't like the word fungal dominant because I think it's misleading. Again, I have yet to see a compost that has more fungus than bacteria. But what I've seen is compost with really great quantities of fungal activity. That's that's really what we want to look. And again, not turning compost. And even if you're big on turning compost, right? Even if you're big on turning compost, you might make some that's more fungal as like top dressing and what have you, or a plant, rather than just spreading it, you know, annually or twice a year on your garden that you're using while planting or when uh, running your cover crop in winter or what have you. Uh, definitely you want that fungal compost. IMO, I am not big on IMO as far as knowledge. Um, I've had a couple people on to talk about it. I would like to get a guest on to discuss Korean natural farming, IMO, who, how can I put this and be nice, is a good speaker. Every single person that I've tried to get to speak, or even the ones I'm like, I, this guy really knows this stuff, and I'll look up a YouTube of him talking. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. I do not know. I am sorry. Oh my God, it's boring listening to these people talk. It's like, I don't know if it's the mindset of the people that gravitate toward it or what, but they just, they don't make an exciting guess. I, when I have them on in a live, I watch the number of people in the live feed going down and the, the information is good, but there's, there's a difference between being able to write a book and being able to speak about a thing in a way that engages people. And I'd love to find somebody that that's not true about to bring on. But I want to point out that all of the things that we're talking about are a form of indigenous microorganisms. Unless we're buying in some microorganisms, which we may do at times. But if we're composting, where do you think the microorganisms came from? There's also ways that we can enhance this by like one of the things I do, and I picked this up from Nick Ferguson, whenever I'm anywhere in my local area and I'm in like forest or what have, have you, and uh, you're, I don't want to say it online. I don't want to be cruel. I don't want to be mean, but somebody's asking if I try this particular person and I've listened to him speak to, and it just, I'm sorry. It's, I don't know what it is. And so, no, he would not be charismatic enough to speak to people for an hour and a half on the subject without them falling asleep. I'm sorry. I hate to say that, but it's how I feel. Anyway, um, I will, if I see a, you know, a, 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 a decomposing branch in the floor of the forest, you know, a couple inches or more in diameter, maybe a foot long, I'll pick it up and take it home. And I have a pile of like fungally inoculated wood i keep a tarp over it and i keep it damp and i'll take that and i will i will crumble it up into compost that's almost finished and allow that or i'll crumble it right into like duft from it into my potting soil for the year will will work out well uh mitchell i don't bullshit i'm sorry i just if i'm gonna bring somebody on to talk to you for an hour and a half then that person has to have good delivery as a speaker. I, it just That's just the way it works. Anyway, or you're not going to listen. It, you know, you, you can't Bueller, Bueller. I just, I'm sorry. It doesn't work. Uh, next up would be um, no to minimal tilling. You're a soil creature. You're in your soil pocket. You're microscopic. You're hanging out. Life is good. You like life the way that it is. It's not too hot. It's not too cold. None of the other soil critters seem to be interested in eating you right now. It's dark. You like dark. It's 
barely light. You're shallow enough that a little bit of light gets through, but just barely. And that's your place. Like all you little critters, you have your own little place, right? Your own little place that you live. You're minding your own business. And then also UV lights everywhere. There's a rush of air. The temperature goes sideways. And you're a little tiny creature. You know what you do? You go tits up and you die. And all of your fellow critters in that soil range that got chopped up, like 90% of them die. And then the grower comes along and puts seeds in the ground and they grow really good. They go, look at how good this works. Well, it works really good because you knock down the weeds and you disrupt the weeds ability to grow, except for all the weeds you stimulate by loosening the soil because all seeds have one of four primary germination triggers. So some seeds are uh, triggered to germinate by fire, some by compaction, and, and many are triggered to grow when soil is loosened up, right? So that germination trigger triggers those. But the other ways it knocks down, but all those critters died, and all their death is what those plants are growing on that year. Well, then you've just knocked back that whole ecosystem. And since we till to the depth of our roots, generally six to eight inches, that's where our primary roots are, we're killing all the biology in the root zone. Yay, us. Gee, why isn't this, why isn't this sustainable long term? Why do I have to keep adding stuff? Because you're killing all the life. That's why. So minimal to no till. And I think there's different ways we can do things. Like if you have ground that's not quite fully managed yet and it still compacts every year, you know, something like a broad fork, which basically it looks like a big pitchfork in a way, but it's a little more robust so it doesn't bend. And you stick it in the ground and you kind of rock it back and it loosens the soil. Or if you were to be converting ground that's never been tilled or grown before, it hasn't been for a long time, first year tilling is also really often effective in getting structure started, but you don't want to till long term. You just don't. And the less you till, the better your soil biology will be long term. Just the way that it is. Um, you want to constantly increase carbon. The carbon content of soil. I personally believe now, after my experience so far with it, that the best way in the world to do that is biochar because you're increasing carbon content permanently. Everything else we do to put carbon into the soil is very temporary at the scale of a human lifetime. Every wood chip that goes into your garden, it breaks down and makes great humus and soil, will off-gas to the point where almost none of the carbon that went in the soil is left and it went back into the atmosphere. That's how it works. When you put carbon in the form of biochar into your soil, your children's 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 children will be long dead and it will still be in the soil. And it will still be fulfilling the role that that carbon has in the soil in being a place for biology to live in, but also being the big thing carbon in soil does is it retains moisture. And if you retain moisture in your fish tank, your fish don't die. So you want to constantly be increasing carbon content of your soil. And you want to keep your soil covered, dark, cool, slash warm, moist. So there's different temperatures that different biology does better at different times. But you'll find, except in the extremes, the soil will have different temperatures of different layers. If you're not tilling... Your critters will migrate up and down in the column to find the Goldilocks zone for them at the time. And you got to keep it covered because a lot of them like to live right near the surface. Well, if it's covered, it doesn't get too hot. It doesn't dry out. And the UV radiation doesn't destroy the little critter. You like the sun. The sun's good for you. Your skin makes vitamin D for your body. Uh, some of these soil critters are more like vampires. A little bit of sun for a little bit of time and vaporized and gone. So if you go around in nature and you see bare soil, you're either in a desert, a beach, or there was a disturbance. Something bad happened, or all three. If you walk through the forest, you almost never see soil. And if you do, like in the fall, a lot of times when the acorns are down, you walk through and you see these little patches of no leaves. Yeah, and you see these, these tracks they kind of look like three fingers and a thumb everywhere. For those that can see me, you know, if those are the turkeys. 
They walk through and they scratch, right? That's a disturbance. Or you find a lot less of them, a little twig broken over. That's a white-tailed deer made a scrape. Now, you can look at that instantly and know something happened and a little bit more closely and know this is a deer scrape. This is squirrels looking for nuts. This is a turkey. Why do you think that is? Because the disturbance is not normal. You can instantly spot it because if there were lots of places where the ground wasn't covered, you wouldn't notice any other ones. Your eye immediately notices that because it's an, it, it's, it's an aberration in nature. It's not normal. It's a disturbance. And then nature will quickly try to fix that in some way. This is disturbed. Those, gen th those seeds that germinate when the soil is loosened will germinate right away and start growing and hold the soil together until it's covered back over with some kind of a earth skin, basically. So we do not want our soil uncovered any longer than necessary. Now, you might have to pull back, you know, mulch to plant. That's fine. I'm just saying long term, you want your soil as covered as possible. Everything will be happier. Everything will be more alive down there. Let's talk about some amendments because I'm promising you if you do this, your need for amendments will go down over time and you'll have to bring in less and less, but you might need some, especially early on. Um, number one is inoculated biochar. And when I say that, I mean, it's been composted. It's had the urine treatment done. It's had compost tea. It's had all three, whatever it is, but it's just not raw biochar that you put in your soil and start sucking up nutrients until it balances out. I think that's a bad way to go. You want a, some form of inoculation. I think that the biggest reason you want the biochar is a place for the organisms to live. There's like a bazillion apartments in a tablespoon of biochar. If you look under a microscope, it's got this incredible structure. It's like the foundation of the coral reef in the ocean. And it goes back to what? Build, hold, increase. It is the primary way that we hold. And we hold not just nutrient, but we hold, hold moisture. One pound of biochar can hold seven pounds of water. Let me say, if you have biochar that weighs one pound dry, it will hold seven pounds of water before it can't take any more water up. That's a big friggin' deal. So biochar would be one. Mycorrhizal fungi. I have a brand I'm using now where... I know I have it oh, right here. Uh, the one I used to recommend is not made anymore. This stuff is called uh, Dino Myco. Uh, I have been very impressed with this. I have a link in the audio notes for this product today. It's made up of small granules, and it says to use, uh, I think it's a teaspoon or a tablespoon. Yeah, a teaspoon to a one pint container. I don't even use that much. This is a very uh, high, uh, high density as far as amount of it. I use about a quarter teaspoon in this to every plant that I'm starting in my seed starting. So I don't use it directly in the garden. I use it like my peppers, my tomatoes, my eggplants and stuff like that, along with some other stuff we're about to talk about. But if you, if you get this stuff going, every time you plant a certain amount of it will become endemic into your garden across time. That's one product that I really, and I really recommend that even for people that are well established uh, because it is the ROI on it is huge. Because you're putting it directly with the roots of the plant, they start out together, they form symbiosis together from the beginning, and that fungal hyphae that that mycorrhizal fungi will put out is huge relative to the root size of the plant, and it will drastically extend your plant's ability to get nutrient and moisture both, and it will make a healthier plant that's more resistant to pests. So that that's what, like if you only did one thing because you're already in pretty good shape you're already making your compost and all that would be the thing that i would highly recommend uh the next would be a good organic fertilizer dr earth is kind of my favorite i have links to my favorite brand or my favorite formula that they make it's a 444 balanced npk fertilizer it has a lot of um active uh bacterium in the beneficial colony forming bacteria in it as well I have a link to Amazon, but I also have a link to DrEarth.com. If you're an MSB member, I don't know if you know this, but you get 10% off everything Dr. Earth sells, which is a pretty big discount, especially if you are a larger like market garden operation uh, and you're going to you know buy a 50-pound bag of that stuff. It's a pretty good discount. 
Uh, and it's one of the bigger companies that we have a discount arrangement with. And I am absolutely sold on the material. I don't recommend them because we have that relationship. I was recommending them for four years before I got that relationship with them because it's just the best off the shelf organic granular fertilizer I have found. Um, the next thing is you want, I don't think you need this, but it certainly doesn't help a good uh, bacterial, beneficial bacterial fungal um, amendment, something that's less a fertilizer and more a great source of, of active colony forming bacterium. The best product I've found for that is made by Happy Frog. These are the same people like the forest soils and what have you. And it's this stuff right here. It's called Cavern Culture. If you look at the uh, the NPK on it, it's very low. It's a one nitrogen, one twelve zero. So this is really not about your macronutrients other than your P, your phosphorus, right? Um, but it's if you looked. You probably can't see it here, but this whole list starting here all the way down to there, that's all beneficial colony forming bacterium. And this is in a dust. And I use when I'm starting my plants as I've learned more and more about forming those symbiotic relationships early when the seeds first are germinating. I put about a quarter teaspoon of the, uh, the dynamico in and about a quarter teaspoon of that stuff into the direct potting soil mix uh, that I have. The other thing I did is nothing to do with fertility, but it works really good. And it's done really well for me since I started doing it. Thank you, James White, for telling me about it. When I start tomatoes now, I put three aspirin tablets in the starter cup. If I was doing six packs, I'd probably put one. When I plant a tomato, I put three aspirin tablets in the hole. And about once a month, I stick an aspirin tablet right next to the root system of every tomato I have and I water it in. And my blight problems are not gone, but they're nearly non-existent. And I have never, until last year when I started doing that, had tomatoes into the first frost. I always give up on them about August. Like, they're just not going to produce enough anymore. I cut all the green berries off and let them ripen and just cut them to the ground and grow something else. Now I'm growing them through. That's a little side tick there. But definitely, if you have soil that can improve. And the other thing I do with this stuff, when I'm making compost tea... I throw a couple tablespoons of this in because it's an extra kick of those, those beneficial microorganisms in there. Anything you're buying like these products that have living things about a one, it kept dry and cool about a one year shelf life and it needs to be replaced. So as you're getting toward the end of a season, go ahead and use it all. I mean, that's, that's the way I look get it in the soil where it can, it can become endemic and go on and self-produce. I'm not saying you need any of these amendments. I'm saying if you're having issues getting started, these are the things that you can bring in to kickstart things off. Again, the one that I'm going to use forever is the mycorrhizal because I've done side-by-side -side trials, even in great soil, and this always wins. And the beneficial bacteria is cheap relative to how much you use. I don't see why anybody wouldn't use it. Uh, kelp meal and or liquid kelp. Um, GS plant foods, liquid kelp. I have links in the show notes. This is, this is my primary thing that I use because not only is it good for soil drenching, it's good for foliar feed. So to get that plant really healthy. So what I'll do with this, I'll add a couple ounces of this stuff to like a one and a half gallon sprayer. And where I'll spray most of my plants is I'll turn the little nozzle upside down and I spray the undersides of the leaves where there's more pores. And they'll take that mineral because there's a huge amount of mineral in this stuff straight in. The kelp meal is more I put straight on the soil. And I use that quite a bit as well. That's And this stuff can seem expensive until you realize we're talking about small amounts per plant and then less and less used every year. Again, I'm giving you the stuff that I ain't where Jack is yet and I want to get there and I want to bridge my way into it. And not all of these would you need. You need to look at what your deficiencies are and pick from this list. Uh, green sand, rock minerals, azomite, all of that stuff is great. It's, an, it's another form of mineral, and it's a mineral formation that's going to be, you know, this is full of minerals. They're instantly available, but it's a short-term thing. Your rock minerals and what have you, especially in combination with Building carbon content and biochar is your forever. You properly amend a garden 
with green sand and one other rock mineral product, let's say green sand and azomite or green sand and basalt, you properly amend it. You should, as long as you don't have an erosion problem, you should never have to do it ever again. It, 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 you know, maybe it's two years in a row and then you never have to do it again. It's not going anywhere. Now, if you're just putting a teaspoon in every hole that you plan, plan in, that's good. You're probably going to do that a lot longer. Nothing wrong with that either. And again, when you start looking at the quantities you can buy and using it that way, it's really, really cheap. It's really, really cheap when it comes down to it. Um, and again, it's a long term. You might want to deal with some specific nutrient deficiencies. As I said, if your soil just doesn't have calcium, which is unlikely, but if it doesn't, then you may need to supplement that. And you can supplement it on a larger scale. If it's a bioavailability program problem, it's there, but you haven't built the life up enough yet, then you're better off, in my opinion, using a immediately available liquid feed. And the two most common outside of the NPK deficiencies in gardens are calcium, magnesium, or and or zinc, iron. Here's the interesting thing. Plants need both of those to, to absorb either of those. So if you have a lot of calcium in your soil, but you don't have any magnesium in your soil, or you don't have sufficient magnesium that's available to the plants. Without the magnesium, the plant can't use the calcium. And vice versa. If you have the, the magnesium but not the calcium, the plant can't use the magnesium without the calcium. It's got to have both of them. So what you will find, what you'll find is that if you, if you look for supplementations for calcium or magnesium, you usually find what's called a cal mag, especially in a liquid. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the word chelated liquid formulation, which is the best way to go. That means that plant can use it immediately. And that means if it gets on the plant, like a foliar feed, it can take it right in through its, its, its leaves and use it. So I have a cal mag and a zinc iron supplement in the show notes and I, if you read those, the write-ups on both of them, they will tell you what to look for. There's certain way, usually you're looking for something called chlorosis. And chlorosis is when you have a plant that's supposed to be green, but it's like light green or yellow green, or, you know, spots of yellow on it that are not a disease. And where the chlorosis forms from top, down, bottom, up, and the pattern that it forms will tell you which one of the two you're more likely to have a deficiency in. And you get a liquid chelate and you use both a soil drench and a foliar with that. And that plant will turn right around for you. And you'll probably find that you don't have a deficiency in your soil because the plants don't need an awful lot of it. You just have not gotten the biology to where the plant can get it yet. But if you keep that on the shelf, you see that, that, that weakness in the plant you shore that up, you'll find that you'll use less and less over time. The truth is, it's part of my fertility plan, my fertility program that I've put out for years. I haven't bought CalMag or zinc iron in about six years now, and I haven't used it in at least five. I just don't need it anymore. But it was the thing that helped me early on before I built up the biology in this very dead soil that I, I have to work with here. Um, final thoughts. Whatever you do personally, create an integrated approach. I call this self-automation. Here's what I mean by that. You can listen to this and say, well, I think Jack's stupid. He doesn't like turn compost. I love turning compost. I'm, I'm, and I need lots of compost fast. So I'm going to stick to the 18 to 21 day Berkeley, Jeff Lawton approved composting method. Or I'm going to use something that Jack didn't even talk about. The com you know, composting with a chicken tractor on steroids, which is kind of a mixture of that first one and the second one put together. Or I don't have that much stuff, so I'm just going to do worm compost. Or, you know, I don't have a chicken coop like Jack does. What I have is a bunch of leaves from the neighbors and wood chips and grass clippings. I'm just going to pile it up and let it, if it takes two years, I don't care. And once I have compost from two years ago, then I'll have new compost every year. And I, I don't care what you do. You take what I said, you put some of it together, you do your own thing. Whatever you do, whatever you do, create an integrated function stacked system. 
so that your daily and or weekly activities take care of things without you having to really think about it to the point where once you have a habit, the habit does the work. And then think of how things can be combined. So here's an example of that. When I discovered biochar, started making it, I didn't change everything that I was doing. All I did was say, okay, what needs to happen to the biochar before it goes into the garden? And thanks to Michael Whitman, I discovered before I even had him on the, on the show, that the easiest thing to do was put the, put the charcoal in the compost when you make the compost. And then just use the compost and you don't have to do anything else. Okay, I'm not going to fight the system. Then I learned if I feed it to my animals, they'll get better feed utilization. Yeah. And their, their crap will stink less. I like both of those. So now biochar goes into the feed every day. It's about a cup, but it's basically an end cap for a four inch pipe. I had one laying in the shop. I threw it in the bucket. It's about the right amount. So I put one to one and a half of those a day in their feed. So that's all right. Now it's already happening. Wherever they poop, they're pooping biochar. When they poop in the coop, they're pooping biochar. But I also learned if I put the biochar in the coop in the bedding, that the coop will stink less. and There'll be less flies. Okay, and it didn't take me long to figure out. And when I clean out the coop and make the compost, it's already in the compost. I don't have to do anything to add the biochar other than make the biochar, put it in buckets, and dump it in places. And I like to make biochar, have a beer, and watch a fire. What's not to love? So that's integrated. On our countertop, we have a little Tupperware thing, you know, like a little sealed up Tupperware like you put cupcakes or cookies in. It sits there. Make coffee in the morning. We take the coffee French press. I have a little bitty metal strainer. I dump it through there, and I throw the strained coffee into the the Tupperware thing. If Dorothy peels a cucumber, the peels go in there. If I chop up one of my big tactical squashes, the, you know, the seed, the pulp, the peelings, whatever, goes in there. Eggs, when we crack an egg, we take the egg shell, and we don't just throw two egg shell halves in there. Take our hands, and we crush it, and we throw it in there. That stuff, some of it goes to the worm farm. Most of it still goes to the chicken pit. It's integrated into my life. When I make my compost, the, all the breakdown stuff and, and chicken and duck poop and water uh, uh, weeds that we feed the chickens and everything in that pit is sitting there. It's right next to the coop. All the bedding's there. We're going to make the freaking compost pile right next to it. Boom, it's combined. It's done. There's no go get this and move this and turn that and, oh, don't forget this. this. It's all integrated into a functional system that works for us. Would that functional system work for you? Maybe not. If you're going to use black soldier flies, you might have a different waste stream, a different way that you acquire that waste stream. But whatever you do, again, I call it human automation. If I have something that's so ingrained in me that I'm going to do every day, then if I can modify my system to wrap around that, I will become a natural organism in my natural ecosystem. Nobody tells the deer, hey, every once in a while, lift your tail and throw some pellets on the forest floor. The deer just runs around being a deer. It eats browse. It's a browsing room in it does a mixture of grazing and browsing and mass harvesting and it spreads nutrient all over the forest because it's a deer it doesn't need somebody to come take it to deer school and explain how to do these things we're smarter than a deer right we don't just run around dropping our pellets everywhere thankfully especially with eight billion of us on the planet that would be nasty however we can integrate what I want to do or need to do into the other things I want to happen. Then we don't forget. Then we don't go, oh, damn, I was supposed to water the plants because we had a timer on the plants. We don't say, oh, I was supposed to add biochar to the compost because compost already has biochar. So when you are, especially when we're doing fertility building, it is so critical it is the keystone of life on our farmsteads that we need to integrate that into a function stacking lifestyle so that our behavior automatically produces the results that we want. We do this with livestock. We do rotational grazing 
all the, the animal's happy to graze. All we're doing is confining it to an area so it'll graze the part we want when it needs to be done. Once we set that system up, it's as simple as opening one gate and closing another. They go do it. They do what's natural to them. We can be a little more sophisticated because we're completely willing, just not partially willing participants like our livestock, and we can do that with ourselves. You know, if we take a walk every day, well, where do you walk? How can you integrate that into your fertility production or anything else on your? Always be thinking about what system connects to what system and how do you, the thinking, living, breathing thing that lives there, make those connections the most effective with the least amount of extra work from your part, right? I'm not like Paul Wheaton saying all the time, I'm lazy. I don't want to work. It's like, we get it, Paul. You're lazy. You don't want to work. But I don't want to do needless work that doesn't really give me a high ROI. Right? I want everything I do to be impactful. I don't want to go walking back and forth. I guess I'm, my, my, my shop teacher, Mr. Fox, the one that would have gotten fired if he'd been around today, the one that I was saying if to a bunch of times, and he said, here, go come here. He didn't want to say it too loud to you know, upset somebody or whatever. He said, I'm going to tell you this. If your aunt had balls, she'd be your uncle. That one, that would really trigger some people today that would say he misgendered a hypothetical aunt. Um, but that guy. I remember when he was talking to us the first day in class about our responsibilities and, you know, safety and don't go inside a line when somebody's in a machine, only one person in there at a time, you know, push, don't pull when you're using a chisel, don't point it at yourself and cut yourself, stuff like that. He was also talking about one of our responsibilities was cleaning up the shop at the end of the day. And we had a roster and different people had different responsibilities. And some days you literally had put your own shit away and you're done. And other days you had kind of a chore to do in the last five minutes before we were done. And, you know, you'd have four or five guys that would have to sweep the shop floor. It's a pretty big wood shop. So you had sawdust and stuff all over the place. And he said, you know, there's people that they get the, they get the broom and they got this big, long space, say 100 foot they need to sweep. And they go back about 10 foot and they sweep it. And then they go further back and they sweep in the same direction. And then they go further back and sweep and further back. And he said, don't do that. Start at one end and sweep all the way to the other end. And I'm sitting there going, does he really need to tell anybody this? And I looked around at some of those kids I was in that class with, and I immediately went, yeah, I guess he does. Because I saw them like, oh, wow, I never thought of that. Um, think that way. In not just the fertility side of things, everything you do on your homestead. If you're walking back and forth, think of how you can walk through in one pass and be done, right? That, that, that's, that's the way to think. As Jeff Lawton says, if you have a, a really good bulldozer operator, he's going backwards no more than 50% of the time because you have to back up, right? But if you're 50-50, you're making the 100% use of the forward motion of the dozer. Of course, there is some backblading and all, but you get his point. But he's like, if you got a guy that's backing up 70% of the time, he's very ineffective as a dozer operator. Again, unless you're backblading. So just try to think that way. I appreciate everybody. I did mark some stuff. Let's see before we wrap up if I can cover a few of these. Jordan DeLome says, is it possible to use pallets for biochar? Some pallets have chemicals, et cetera. You just answered your own question. If you know that the pallet doesn't have a saturation of chemicals, you can actually make really great biochar out of pallets. And remember, since we're going to paralysize wood, which means we're going to drive off everything, some chemicals are like metals and stuff like that will remain in the char. We'd prefer not to do that. But if it's a volatile, it's going to burn off. Right. So if it's heavily saturated, it's kind of a toxin going in the air, but it, it would be pretty mitigated risk. So if you know the source and they're not clearly saturated in things that would stay in uh, the wood after it was made in the char, sure you can. Personally, I think that pallets have a lot of nails in them and that can be bad when it comes to crushing your biochar. Certain things nails shouldn't go in. Uh, so if you're using a wood chipper, that would be bad. So don't do that. Uh, but otherwise, I think it's perfectly fine. I just think there's a lot of other better feedstocks out there and that pallets are generally better as construction uh, material 
than they are for biochar feedstock. K Bonk says mushroom boards are kind of cool for building stuff. I don't know what mushroom boards are. You, you stumped me, K Bonk. Somebody wants to tell me, I'll check when we get through these. 229 Mix says, How precise do you need to be with using urine for fertility? I'm thinking, for example, I should pee in my outdoor hydro tank. Or would something like that need to be more measured and metered? Well, you have to be careful with your outdoor hydro tank because it's about how many gallons. And there is kind of like a 15 to 1 um, ratio is about right to make urine into immediately usable um, for liquid fertilizer. So for you know a gallon of urine, you could dilute it as much into 15 gallons. Um, and I think seven to one is the recommended absolute minimum. So I don't know how, and then you're peeing in your hydro tank, hydro, generally we're talking non living system. We're using, uh, you know, nutrient solution and urine has kind of in an aquatic system, a nitrate nitrite cycle. So I've seen people do what you would call pee ponics, kickstart aquaponic systems with that. I don't necessarily recommend it for hydro systems where we're more in an inner nutrient only solution, though maybe other people didn't, didn't have a problem with it, but it doesn't have to be real precise. It's not like if you're one point too high, everybody dies or something like that. Uh, Joe Jordan says a regenerative future with Matt powers podcast, huge on soil microbiology. I love Matt and his work. So thanks for mentioning him. Chop and drop willow for natural uh, aspirin uh, from a standpoint of reducing blight as grumpy green guy. I would not say that it's an equivalent. We're not really exactly sure what in the aspirin is actually causing the reduction in blight. Willow works really good as a rooting stimulant, but it's, that's not what's fighting off the blight. Is it the uh, salicylic acid? I, I don't know. Nobody's really clearly defined the why behind this yet. The, so, the studies are often not definitive done with it, but I think it's because a lot of studies, as you guys know, are all about isolation and um, you know nothing else is done. So if you don't have living soil, then it may not be as effective at warding off blight because blight colonizing inert soil versus living soil is a totally different competition. So I know it works because I've done it and I've heard from enough people who have done it that the, the, the difference in using aspirin with tomatoes in places that are blight prone is night and day for a lot of people. So we know that it works at least for a lot of people. Um, somebody here, where was it? K-Bonk. Okay, so Jack, uh, K-Bonk says, Jack, uh, mushroom boards are weathered looking boards they grow mushrooms on. Okay, cool. I don't know how much it would help with fertility, but uh, another source of cool building material. Hope you guys enjoyed today. If you did, do consider helping us out. By doing your online shopping where tspaz.com item of the day for you i'm bringing back around i haven't talked about these since i brought them around the first time they didn't sell real well i thought they would they're flat bottom reusable grocery bags and i just love these things guys we uh we originally found some bags like this at albertson's years ago and they they were like a couple bucks a piece these are like eight bucks a piece they were a couple bucks a piece maybe three or four dollars a piece, something like that. And we bought two of them and they're fantastic and they disappeared and we never saw them again. These are basically a cloth box and they have a flat bottom and they have an insert. So when you set them down and you put your groceries, everything stays put. You put them in your trunk, they don't roll over and flip. I am all about reusable grocery bags. I hate seeing plastic bags hanging from trees embedded on roots and stream banks and stuff like that. It's disgusting. And this is like one of those small things that you can do to be more environmentally friendly. That's actually, you also get a better result. So I'm all about it. But I think that in the little video I did in this write-up, I said something that I think I'm wrong about now. That I think that because I've heard from a lot of people who are using them for things like 
trunk organizers, pantry organizers. And what I said is, you know, you probably could find something better for that because you won't care that it folds flat. Yeah, but it's probably going to cost more if it doesn't fold flat. And if it does fold flat, what Don and Yusuf folds flat and puts away, and they have like no shipping costs because they're easy to ship a box of five of them. And so I've heard from a ton of people now that have one or two in their trunk and they have like their, their basic tools or their, you know, their vehicle kit or other stuff or, you know, like their soccer mom stuff or whatever in these. And they work really well. And because of their size, they're kind of a perfect size for a lot of sh open shelving systems. So a lot of people are using them like for their blackout kit and things like that. And at about eight bucks a piece, and you get five of them for 30 something dollars. So they're less, they're like seven bucks a piece. Um, they're pretty good for that. And I definitely recommend that you check them out. But if you start using them in your shopping, you, you're not going to want to go back to the crap, right? The crap of the little plastic bags or the reusable bags that, you know what I'm talking about? They fall over, nothing fits in them, right? These are great. Even the checkers love them. So definitely check those out real quick before I go. Eka Mouse, Eka Mouse, you're asking me. Incubator answer. What is the question? I missed it. If you give me the question before I go, Eka Mouse, because you're so awesome at threatening people that they better hit that like and smash that like button for us, that I'll hang on for just a bit and answer your question for you. What incubator answer? What is the question? And I'll try to get it for you. Uh, with that, I hope you guys uh, enjoyed this episode. I really want to encourage you to start thinking more and more about building the fertility on your property in a more permanent, long lasting, more sustainable way. We can all go out and buy more stuff every year as inputs, but then we are reducing the value of our crop by increasing the expense of producing it. And we're also more reliant on others. Trying to drag it out for you, Eek. I, uh, it, oh, here it is. Here's what Eek Mouse said. High failure rate with incubator with rocker, 50 to 60% humidity, 98 to 101 temps, red dot on yoke when inspected, question fertility. Send me an email on that. Let me do a more involved answer for you there. But if you're not getting good hatch rates from a good incubator, and that's about where you need to be, 50 65% humidity, 98 101 temp. You probably do have fertility issues. But send me more details by email, and we'll get you into a listener feedback show. With that, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. I'll be back tomorrow with an expert counsel Q&A show of the week. I'll catch you then.